This is Patrick Clayton. He is a veteran. He served in the Army, which is a branch of the Armed Forces. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about what he did in the Army and the sacrifices that soldiers made. Um, he's only going to talk for a little bit, and then he will answer some of you guys' questions. Please be respectful while he's talking. Our voices are off. Hey, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Katie. Um, good morning, everyone. Actually, I guess it is afternoon. I did that yesterday, too. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to allow me to speak with you all. Um, like Miss KB said, I am her brother. Um, if you ask her, I, I am her favorite brother. Um, and I am going to sit here and just kind of talk to you guys a little bit about uh, my time that I had spent in the Army. Um, like Miss Katie said, the Army is part of the... Uh, uh, branch, uh, it's a branch of the uh, U.S. military, which is part of the armed forces. Um, and I'm just going to give you just a little bit of a background uh, of my time in the Army, and then I'm just going to kind of go through a few stories, and, and we're going to talk about some sacrifices. Um, so to begin, um, I joined the Army back in January of 2003, which is way before any of you were born. <laughs> so it makes me feel a little bit older there. Um, I did, uh, my basic training was in Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I was there for about 17 weeks before I was sent to my first duty station, which happened to be in a little town called Schweinfurt, which is located in Germany. So the first four years that I was in the army, I actually spent it overseas in Germany. Uh, while I was over there, I had a couple deployments. My first one was in 2003. I had deployed to uh, a little country in the Balkans called Bosnia. Um, we were just going there just uh, as a more of a, of a practice um, to see if we could set up shop over there and then tear down and then come right back. So it was a, it, we called it a, a quick reaction uh, relocation. Um, but I did spend a few months there while we did that. Uh, my next deployment that I did do was in 2004, is at the beginning of 2004. Um, and I was uh, stationed in or I was uh, deployed to Iraq. Uh, I was actually deployed to Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit. It's located about in the center of Iraq. And that's where I spent uh, a year. Um, when I came back from there, I was uh, I changed duty stations. And so I went from Germany over to Fort Lewis, Washington, which is located pretty close to Seattle. So uh, that is where I spent the majority or the rest of my time in the Army. During my time there, though, I did deploy once again to Iraq. This time I was deployed to a town called Bakuba, which is about 40 miles northeast of Baghdad. So a little bit more southern uh, than Tikrit. Uh, and I was there from 2007 to 2008. I was actually deployed there for almost 15 months. Um, so that was just kind of a little history of, of my time in the Army. Altogether, I spent eight years in the Army. I was there from January 2003 until the end of 2010. Um, uh, so just kind of going off from what Miss Katie was talking about and uh, going into sacrifice a little bit. Sacrifice is defined as to give up something or sell something at a price which is less than its value. Um, so really what I want to focus on there is to give up something at a price that's less than its value. Um, so going into the army, I knew that I would be sacrificing a lot. Um, but there was a lot of things I didn't realize I was going to be sacrificing. Uh, when I first started, uh, in basic training, I knew that I wouldn't be able to talk to my family or play video games, um, or even like see my friends as much. We didn't have cell phones back then, so I wasn't going to be missing that. So I didn't have to worry about that one too much, but um, something kind of odd happened when I was in basic training, and that was I didn't realize that I was going to miss sitting down. Uh, when I was in basic training, we were running everywhere, we were marching, and when we were inside of our barracks, we just sat on the floor. We never sat in chairs. And so um, I didn't realize how much I was missing sitting in chairs until one day my drill sergeant left a chair sitting in our, in our barracks, and I decided that I was going to sit down. As soon as I sat down, my drill sergeant came into the room and saw me sitting there, and I got in a little bit of trouble. I had to carry the chair everywhere I went, 
for the next couple days. And every time we stopped running or walking or marching, I'd have to sit the chair down and then I'd have to sit on it. So while everyone was standing around, I was sitting on this chair. And it doesn't sound like it was a, a bad punishment, but chairs get heavy after a while. And when you're having to run miles with the chair, it gets really annoying. <laughs> so um, those are just, you know, so, like a little sacrifice that you don't think about beforehand, but just kind of some of the creature comforts there. Um, so after basic training, I moved to Germany. Um, I knew I was going to a different country. I knew that there would probably be a little bit more sacrifices there. Um, but a few things that didn't really click were I was going to a different time zone. So being able to to speak on the phone with friends and family or even through email, it became more difficult than I thought. Um, there was an eight hour time difference between Germany and Utah. So when I was waking up in the morning, most of my friends and family were going to bed. Um, when I was getting off from work, they were waking up to go to work. And so in the evening, when it was time for me to give them a call, most of my friends and families were at work or at school. And so I wasn't able to talk to people. Uh, and then on the few occasions where I was able to talk to people, mainly on the weekends um, or sometimes in the evening, um, international calls are expensive. Um, they could add up to almost 60 cents a minute. And so I had to make uh, more brief calls. I, I wasn't able to, to talk for as long as I wanted to on some of those phone calls. Um, but these, these little sacrifices, I didn't really see them and I didn't really realize that they were going to be there until it happened. But I think the biggest sacrifice that I never really thought at all the way through didn't come until my first deployment to Iraq. Um, we had actually moved up from Kuwait. We had landed in Kuwait and we'd spent some time uh, acclimating to the weather because the weather's a little bit different in Iraq and Kuwait than it is here in the States. And so we spent some time in Kuwait and then we moved up into Iraq. So it was uh, actually March 13, 2004. Uh, we'd only been in, in country for just a few short days. Uh, my squad was actually out on a patrol. We were walking through the city when we heard an explosion just on the other side of, of town. It was just really just a few blocks over. So we rushed over there to see what was going on, to see if, if anybody needed our assistance. We were hearing some radio calls that, you know, they needed our help. So we went over there and we were helping them out, doing what we could do. Uh, so later on, we ended up making our way back to the base and we came walking in. And it was then that I learned that two soldiers that I had known and trained with and even called uh, friends, had paid the ultimate sacrifice during that explosion and had passed away. Um, those two people, it was Captain John Kurth and Specialist Jason Ford. They were uh, the first two soldiers that, that had uh, died from enemy contact in our battalion um, when we first deployed there. So some that just kind of always stuck with me after that and some that I always tried to pass on is that just remember that when you see any kind of un uniform uh, men and women, when they don that uniform, that all of them will give some sort of sacrifice, but some of them will give, will give sacrifice, will sacrifice all. All right. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about. Miss um, Katie and Mr. Parker said you guys had a few questions, so I'm open to any kind of questions. You want to show them your medals case first? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You forgot All that right. yesterday. Well, I think you're you're more excited about it than I am sometimes. <laughs> All right, let me know if you can see it, if it's too far over here. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go widescreen here. Let's see if this helps. Um, right there, are you able to see that all? Yes. All right. So this is just a little shadow box case that I have. Um, this was something that was given to me by my wife, but it has my medals in here. Um, so kind of starting from the top on the left side, I'm not sure if it's a mirror image or not, but I, it'll be my left. Um, so starting up top, this blue one right up here, that's called the, the combat infantry man's badge. So any infantry soldier that does spend time in a combat zone and sees combat would end up with this, uh, this badge here. So that is something that I had there. Um, going down, looking at my medals here, uh, this top one on the right, my right, I don't know if it's your right or not. Uh, it's going to be that purple one. That is actually the Purple Heart medal. Uh, that one signifies that I was actually injured in a combat zone. So I had uh, sustained some sort of injury due to uh, an en enemy combatant. 
Um, so right there, there's a little oak leaf cluster in there. That means I got two of them. Most people don't end up with one. Somehow I ended up with two. I guess I just didn't duck fast enough. Uh, right next to that one is gonna be the Army Accommodation Medal. Um, so I got a couple of those. Uh, just below the Purple Heart, you can see the Army Achievement Medal. Uh, that one has four oak leaf clusters in there. Um, and I ended up uh, with uh, five or six of those. I don't think it's fully up to date on how many I have in there. Um, a couple of those are funny stories on how I, how I got those, but uh, it's a story for another time. Next to that is going to be the Army Good Conduct Medal. So for every three years that you spend in the Army uh, that you don't get in trouble, you basically get this medal. So it's more of a good job for not getting in trouble. Um, then moving down, you've got the uh, some different ones, the National uh, Defense Service Medal, the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, the Iraq Campaign, just kind of showing where I spent my deployments and that I was uh, in the Army during the Global War on Terrorism. Moving down, you've got the Army Service Ribbon and I've got the Overseas Ribbon, just showing how many t different times I'd spent overseas. Um, so for every single time that I, I left my duty station and went overseas, or if I spent any time in a duty station overseas, it would count my years. So a total, I spent four years overseas. That's kind of what that is showing. Yeah. So that, that includes my, my two uh, tours to Iraq and then, of course, my duty station when I spent some time in Germany there. Uh, so kind of moving over here, um, we've got different little badges that kind of emphasize uh, the units I was with, that's talking about the 1st Infantry Division um, and then the 2nd Infantry Division. Those were two different units I had spent some time in. And then you've got the light blue cord on the very end right over here. I guess it's more of a darker blue. Um, this one is actually the uh, infantry cord, the infantryman's cord. Um, every infantry soldier who graduates from infantry basic training will receive that cord. And then right next to it, the silver looking one, that is actually the German shoots and snare. It's a, it's an award I got when I went with the German army to go and uh, learn how to shoot their weapons and kind of go through their training qualifications. So that was kind of a neat award and a neat experience. But yeah, that's my location right there. Up top is the flag that I got uh, when I retired from the army. Um, so although I only spent eight years in the army, um, Part of my injuries that I had sustained actually caused me um, to not be able to continue on with my time in the Army. And I was uh, retired from the Army uh, at only eight years in. So I got a retirement flag and, and, a, and a full retirement ceremony. It was a, it was a pretty neat thing for me, uh, but kind of uh, uh, bittersweet that I didn't get to finish uh, uh, the full 20 years that I wanted to spend in the Army. Okay. So that was kind of my whole presentation there. Perfect. Well, thank you, Patrick. All right, Darren, let's just do what we did yesterday, and we'll do two and switch back and forth. So who wants to ask Mr. Clayton a question? Me. Jackson, come up to the computer so we can hear you. And I got the questions written. So with the, we have more time. So this is Jackson. His dad's actually in the garden. He was deployed a couple years ago for like eight months. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, um, how many times have you been shot? <laughs> I've only been shot once. I actually was shot in my leg, in my right leg, um, while on a patrol. <laughs> in in uh, It was actually in a village called Shekhamad Village, which is just outside of Bakuba. Uh, we were looking for a guy who had been taking pop shots at us, meaning he was just kind of popping up and shooting at us randomly. And uh, needless to say, we found him that day. However, we didn't capture him that day. <laughs> or I should say he found me that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want to come ask him? Come, come by the computer so he can hear you. Um, Do you have nightmares of the army? Um, no, not really. Um, I have uh, some times where it's, it's uh, I, I guess I have like hard memories, um, just remembering friends and different situations. Uh, so sometimes that's hard to, to kind of deal with, but um, I, I have been working 
on it. And so they don't necessarily keep me up at night, but sometimes I do uh, think about it and it does uh, make for some, some hard times. All right, Mr. Parker, do you want to ask a question? Yep, I got a couple. And I'll be the one reading them. Um, these are questions written by my students that I'll read. Um, okay. So question number one, um, why did you join the Army? Okay, so uh, so why did I join the Army? Um, shortly after September 11, 2001, when the planes hit the World Trade Center, um, it kind of hit me a little bit differently, and I felt uh, a little bit of a, of, a, of a want and a desire to serve our country, but I just didn't have the right push. And my older brother, uh, another one of Miss Katie's older brother, actually ended up signing up for the Army uh, and joining. And him and I had a long conversation about it. And, and I talked to him about my desires and hopes to join as well. Um, and he kind of gave me that little bit of a push. So he ended up uh, starting uh, or joining the Army just a few months before I did. Um, but he had joined with a plan to just do his six years, and then he was going to get out and uh, use the Army's GI Bill to go to college. And I had decided that I was going to join and I was going to make it a career and I was going to stay in there for the full 20 years and retire uh, with all the, the glory of, of being retired from the Army. And it turned out just because of uh, life circumstances. Um, here we are 17 years later. He's uh, he's still in the Army. Actually, it's, uh, it's oh, 18 years. 18 years later, he's still in the Army. I have gotten out. I used my GI Bill to go to college, so we kid around that we are living each other's dreams. That's funny. Yeah. All righty. And for my next question, our next question, um, let me see if I can phrase this so it's not confusing. Um, so when you were, when you are in combat, um, like, what strategies do you guys use to know when an enemy is coming towards your location? Um, so it really kind of depends on what kind of situation we're in. Um, so we actually have different tactics um, to combat uh, different situations. So if we're getting, uh, for, for instance, if we're inside of a vehicle, um, we normally travel, or at that time, we would normally travel in a four-vehicle convoy. And so depending on what side we are getting attacked from is how we're going to react. Uh, generally speaking, two vehicles would maintain contact while the other two, generally the ones on the end, would go around and then flank. Um, by flanking, I mean they're just going to come in from a different direction. And you more or less make kind of an L shape around the enemy and then you push through them both. Um, there's a lot of communication that goes in, into it. Because as you're pushing one way or the other, you're going to have some crossfire. So you've got to be knowing who's where and you're communicating all the time. So we've got constant radio communication. Uh, you've probably seen it a lot on, on TVs and stuff that um, everybody's always talking on a radio and stuff. So that's how we would do it. Um, that's a pretty simple kind of a, a, a reaction to an ambush is, is what that would have been. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, my kids, who wants to go next? Juan and then Allison. Um, did anybody steal your equipment in battle? What do you mean by anybody? Like the enemy, did they ever steal our equipment? Yeah. Um, nobody really stole anything. However, sometimes things would end up missing. And uh, when they would end up missing, sometimes they'd end up in the wrong hands. Um. So nobody really came into where we were at and would take our stuff. Sometimes we would just either leave it um, out in the city for some reason, or if uh, if there was some sort of accident or an ambush and some equipment would fall off the vehicle, that's when they would kind of take it up. Makes sense. Hey, Alpha. What kind of food did you eat out on the field? Uh, we ate delicious MREs. MREs oh. are meals ready to eat. They come in a bag. It is freeze-dried food. And the first few times you ever have them, you're going to wish that you never ate them. Um, by four or five years in, they were the most delicious things ever. And you would uh, sometimes hit the holy grail and get one that everybody wanted, and you could trade it for just about anything. All right, Mr. Parker. 
Alrighty, so this next t um, question, like, were there times you were really scared, or was it scary well, when you were there? Yeah, I would say that there was a lot of times it was pretty scary. Um, there's some times where you're just reacting and you don't really have time to think about it. Um, but usually after that, what would happen maybe when we got back to the base or maybe if there was kind of like a lull in the action, just meaning there was nothing going on, that's when it all kind of sink in and, and you'd be scared for sure. Um, it, it, it's hard not to be scared because at that point you're really thinking about every different kind of scenario that can happen. Um, I, I, uh, I like to, to say this sometimes. Um, when I, when I did get uh, shot in my leg, I knew that I had been shot. I could look down and see that I had been shot, but I refused to believe it myself just because you don't want to think about that. And so I was running through different kinds of situations in my head. And that's kind of where you go to. You're, you're so scared of what you might see if you look down that you just completely ignore it and almost come up with a different scenario of what could have happened instead. Okay, and then the next one we have, did you, any, during the time you were serving, did you have a wife or child or children? I actually did, yes. Um, so I was actually, I got married shortly before I uh, went on my first deployment. And on my second deployment, uh, I did have a uh, two-year-old son. Um, he's now uh, 15. And I also now have a uh, a five year old and a three year old. So the uh, the five and three year old don't even realize that I was ever in the army. Whereas my fifteen year old um, actually spent some time at some different uh, stations when he was younger, and he remembers the times when I was in in the army. Okay, our turn. Who wants to go next? That's that. In the army, what kind of guns did you guys use? Um, so we used the uh, the M16. Um, it was actually a little bit of a different version. We called it the M4 because it was a carbine, just meaning it was a shorter version of the M16. Uh, we also had the uh, let's see, the M249 saw. Saw just stands for Squad Automatic Weapon. It just is is just an automatic version of that gun that holds uh, belt fed ammo instead of a magazine fed ammo. Um, we also used a 240 Bravo, which is just a bigger machine gun. Um, we also had uh, grenades that we would carry and then uh, there were a couple people who had automatic grenade launchers. Um, so that was just what we would carry just on a person walking around. Uh, and then we had vehicles that had much bigger guns on top of them. We, we used different kinds of vehicles all the way from small Humvees that had no armor on them to Humvees that did have armor on them to a Bradley fight, fighting vehicle, which is very similar to like a small tank. And then even the, um, the striker, which is an eight, uh, wheeled amphibious vehicle. So it kind of looks like a boat with eight wheels on it. Um, Patrick. Will you explain to them what your job was so that they understand why you had so many guns on you? <laughs> I was infantry, meaning that I was a frontline soldier. So a lot of uh, any kind of action movies or, or war movies that you might watch it, those guys that are on the front line that are constantly doing the fighting and everything, that is what my job was. Um, who, Allison, did you ask that? Who had, Leah, have you asked? Okay, can I ask a question? Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. Have you ever gotten ambushed by your enemies? Yes. Uh, so I, I, I want to make sure I heard that right. Had, had we ever gotten ambushed by the enemy? Yeah. Yep. Uh, numerous times. Um, so I'm sure that you probably have heard that sometimes they would set up little roadside bombs. Um, so they would do that to us sometimes. Uh, sometimes they would set that up to get us to look one way, but they were actually on the other side of the road. Uh, hidden in buildings, so as soon as we would look one way, they would attack us from behind, basically. Um, that happened uh, quite a bit. Um, there was one time um, I, I talked about uh, how I had two Purple Hearts. Uh, the second one actually came from an ambush as well. Um, we were we were walking around in the city once again, and uh, 
there was somebody who was wearing a suicide vest, meaning it was a vest that had explosions on it, and they walked into the middle bus and detonated. Uh, they were standing really close to me, uh, standing close to a, a bunch of my friends as well, and a bunch of us got hurt on that day. Um, that was just something that, that would happen. Um, I have many, many recollections of being ambushed. Uh, very rarely were we on the, uh, uh, the offensive side. We were playing a lot of defense. Okay, Mr. Parker. Okay, this one's a little bit more of a relaxed question. All right. Can you play video games while on uh, while in the military? Absolutely. We uh, we got really good at video games. Um, when we weren't uh, so in Iraq, when when we didn't have patrols to be on, we'd be spending a lot of time playing video games. Although we were over there for fifteen months, we were really only spending about uh four to eight hours a day uh or at a time really in the city and then we'd be back for 48 hours or four to eight hours and so in between that time we were playing a lot of video games um we got we got pretty good at playing video games of course this is uh back in 2003 so the graphics probably weren't as good as what they are now so, um, and stuff. No, not Atari. You just say CDs. <laughs> no, we, we, we were classic we Xbox. We were we were playing on on the PlayStation Two and the Xbox. <laughs> the Atari. Oh my gosh, Patrick, you just called us old. Uh, no, no, no. We called you old. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> Do you have another one, Mr. Parker? Yeah. Um, did you ever drive in a tank? Uh, not in a tank, but in the Bradley fighting vehicle. It's it's a little bit of a smaller tank. Uh, not only did I drive in it, I got to drive it. And then at one point uh, in my career, I was the master driver, basically meaning I was the one who was giving the licenses to drive those those different vehicles, the the tanks, the Humvees. Um, so when you would when you would get your uh, your license to to drive a regular car um, at 16, we did a very similar thing to uh, to military vehicles. So you'd have to go through the course and learn how to drive those. Um, the course wasn't the same. You didn't have to know how to parallel park. Instead, you had to know how to go through the desert as fast as you could, and you could drive those things underwater and, and in a bunch of different cool things like that. Okay, Patrick, I have a question for you, but it's a two-part question. No. Oh. You can check oh, me up yeah. here. Tricky questions. One, when you were in Iraq, were you ever there over holidays, like Christmas or Thanksgiving? And how did you celebrate it if you were in Iraq? Um, so I actually, um, the first deployment that I had, uh, it was a solid year. Um, it went from the beginning of February 2004 until the end of February 2005. Uh, so during that time, I missed... Uh, Two Valentine's Days, uh, just going all the way through some of the major holidays there. You've got uh, Memorial Day, uh, Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, Labor Day. You, I've missed all of those. Um, for the most part, uh, we were probably out on patrol during those times because if it was a big uh, holiday for uh, the U.S., it was, a, it was an opportunity for um the enemy to think that we wouldn't have our guard up so we were doing a lot of patrols during that time did you say your battery died can you not hear me anymore then you're i can still hear you i don't know where the plug is in so she's she's trying frantically to change it yes okay i fixed it okay so yeah i i uh like I said, that uh, that was a good time for the enemy to kind of uh, try to catch us with our guard down because it was a holiday for us, thinking that we'd be back hanging out. And uh, so we were usually out on patrol. However, we did get to spend some time um, having like little bonfires um, and even just kind of going to the mess hall and getting like a, like a Thanksgiving dinner or even uh, a Christmas dinner. Um, so just kind of depending on what it was, but they weren't nearly like what it is back at home. So I missed out on all those holidays. Sorry. 
Katie, is it my uh, turn now or? Okay, I have one more question down and then you can go. Okay. Did you ever get homesick? Yes, uh, quite a bit. Um, sometimes when you're just sitting alone or you're just kind of driving around and you're just lost in your thoughts, you definitely get uh, homesick quite a bit. Hi, Dan, it's your turn. Okay, my students keep coming up with more and more questions. I having a hard time to keep up with them. <laughs> um, so, what kind of body armor did you wear? Um, so we had the typical body armor, uh, which is is generally like a plate carrier with a with a bulletproof vest that kind of just sat right here in front, and then there's one in the back. Um, we had some side plates as well. But the more armor you put on yourself, the, the harder it is to move around. And uh, so generally it was really just kind of the helmet and the plate carrier is what we were wearing. Okay. So there was a lot of uh, open areas where we could be uh, injured, um, but the vital organs were actually supposed to be um, kind of protected there. Alrighty. And then I know you were in the army, but I'm getting a few kids asking about like if you've ever been to sea or gone seasick or anything like that. All right, I didn't hear that one. It looks like I'm getting some feedback. It's probably from Katie's classroom, I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So we we know you were in the army, um, but a few of my students are wondering if you've ever gone to sea or been seasick. I, I still cannot understand that. I'm getting some feedback here. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what to do. Type <laughs> it in the chat box, Dan. Okay. Can you, Miss Katie, can you mute yours? I think that's where the, I'm going to see if that's where it's coming from. Can you hear oh, me? I think that's perfect. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, for my third tr attempt. <laughs> um, so we know you are in the army, but a few of my kids are wondering if you've ever been at sea or and gotten seasick or anything like that. All right. So um, I've never been at sea um, as far as the army goes, but um, I did. I actually will get seasick pretty easily. I can't do a cruise or anything like that without getting seasick. Um, but my wife, uh, that I'm married to her, uh, her dad was actually in the army, um, for, for 20 years and he was actually a army, um, boat captain. So the army does have some boats and they do spend some time in the water and he was a boat captain. Um, so that was something that he did, but I've never spent any time on a boat. So I have two more students that want to ask you a question. Sure. Okay, let's go Allison and Jordan. How long did you have to train? So my initial training was for basic training and that was 17 weeks. After that, uh, we were training almost every day that, that I was in the army. Um, when you're in the army and you're, and you're kind of in the dangerous situations that we're in, you want to have a lot of trust and a lot of training behind you. So the majority of our time was just spent uh, being able to work seamlessly with your team and your squad, uh, almost being able to, to communicate both verbally and non-verbally to be able to kind of almost know what other people are thinking before, uh, before they kind of give you the signal. So I would say every day we spent training. So eight years. <laughs> All right, Jordan, what's your question? Were you in the 9-11 attack? I was not in the 9-11 attack. So that was with the uh, the World Trade Centers. Um, I was actually, I had just graduated from high school. And uh, I think I had a part-time job or a full-time job as a security guard. Um, but I, I didn't have anything to do with the 9-11 attacks. Okay, uh, I have one more kid. Sure. He's letting his dog in there. Fine. Sorry, my dog is growling and he'll start barking if I don't let him out. Okay. Uh, have you ever drove? Have you ever driven a helicopter? 
Good. I actually have spent many time in the helicopter. We uh, we had done uh, a lot of training doing uh, what what we call um, air assaults with the helicopter. So the helicopter will come in and kind of land, and everybody jumps out. Or we can even fast rope using uh, using rope to kind of like repel out real fast. Um, so I, I did spend some time in a helicopter. Well, I just learned something new. I never knew you repelled out of a helicopter. Oh yeah. Look at this. Okay, does anybody else, Darren, do you guys have any more questions? I still have a few if you still have the time. Oh yes. <laughs> okay, I got, I got four here, assuming that my kids don't give me any more. <laughs> I was like, okay. 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 And about three hands shot up again, but when, <laughs> just cut us off whenever you need to. Oh, um, no, we're, we're fine. Because some of the, we got some very specific, interesting ones that they just want to know. So, okay. does the Army still use duck boats? <laughs> do I know? do not know. Okay. So, sorry, he doesn't know that one. <laughs> okay. Um. This is a follow-up question on that vehicle that you said you drove that was kind of like a tank. About how big is that actually again? Um, I mean, it's it, it weighs like, I think it's 60 tons that it weighs. So 60 tons would be 120,000 pounds. Um, it's, it's quite a large vehicle. It, if you were to look at it, you would, you would think that it's a tank, but it, it's, it's still a baby tank. Um, the tanks that we use now, the, the Abrams tank is quite large. <laughs> um, so to kind of give you a, a feeling on how big this is, the Bradley fighting vehicle, which is the, that little tank that I was in, uh, is roughly nine feet tall. Uh, nine feet wide and has about three inches uh, of three inch thickness of armor all the way around and has a cannon that shoots uh, a bullet that uh, measures in at 25 millimeters and 25.4 millimeters is an inch. So the bullet is, uh, is an inch thick and then it's about eight inches long is what that would be. Um, so that's the kind of uh, uh, bullet that that one would shoot um, a tank is going to be um, probably the same height, uh, but instead of being nine feet wide, it's probably closer to 12 feet wide. Um, I think the Bradley fighting vehicle is about 25 feet long, whereas the, the tank is closer to 35 feet long. And the round that it shoots uh, is 250 millimeters. So it is 10 times that size. <laughs> so instead of it being uh, one inch in thickness, it is 10 inches in thickness. So kind of kind of a little bit of a difference there. Um, and then the armor on the tank, I believe, is six inches thick. <laughs> so small, well, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. They are they are definitely big vehicles. And I, I want to say it weighs double what uh what the Bradley one. I think I think it it's it's a hundred tons. But please don't quote me on it. <laughs> okay. Um my class is literally going to keep going forever here, so I'm just going to end on this last question here. Sorry, sure. guys. Um, but so the last question I would like to end on is: What gave you the courage to do some of the hard things that you did? Um, really, it was the the people around me. Um, everyone around you is depending on everyone around you. Um, so I wasn't necessarily doing it for myself. I was doing it for for my buddy next to me. Uh, I knew that if I didn't do it, uh, that uh, somebody might not do it for him or, or might not be able to do it for him. Um, so that was always my, my thought going into things. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this for him. Um, and I was left that up to that, that him is more just the person next to me who's ever next to me. Um, every time I was stacking up to a door to go into a building or every time that we were donning our gear to go out on patrol, I was always thinking about the person next to me, not necessarily myself. Um, I don't know kind of where that courage comes from. Um, it was just, to me, it was always just, I've got to do it for, for that person next to me. Hopefully that, uh, that answers that question. I, I think it does. All right. Okay. My, 
My class is a bit upset with me, but I'm not going to keep asking questions because <laughs> they really are going to go for quite a while. <laughs> we gotta All right, well, we want to thank you, Patrick. What do you guys tell him? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for having me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoy this. Uh, so feel free to uh, uh, invite me back anytime. Uh, that is if I'm 